Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Craig Newman. I'm the manager of planning with the city of White Rock, and it's my pleasure to uh, to start start tonight's public information meeting. Um, we're just waiting for a couple people to join on the back end, but I think we can get started and I'll, I'll provide an overview of the application and then we'll have a presentation by the, the proponent. So the application that we have in front of us tonight is an amendment to a major development permit. It's permit uh, 288. And there are also requested variances from the city's sign bylaw. And the project is at uh, the Miramar development at 15177 Thrift Avenue. It relates specifically to buildings uh, three and four. So the purpose of the digital public information is tonight to share information with the public regarding the exterior signage program. So to get into the details of the proposal and also to, to go through the nature of the relief that's being sought uh, by the applicant as it relates to the, uh, the sign bylaw and then to receive your feedback and questions tonight. It is a live event, so it's being presented live by uh, City of White Rock staff and EDG Experience Design Group. Um, it is being recorded, so we will post a recording of the, the video presentation to the city's web page. So if uh, you know of someone that may want to see it, feel free to spread the word. Uh, questions that we received, so there is a Q&A function within the viewer, so we're not going to publish the questions as they come in. Uh, we will have a Q&A section after the, the applicant's presentation, and af at that time we'll publish the, the comments and questions as, they, as, as we have them on our screen. Uh, questions that aren't related to the application or aren't respectful in nature will, will not be published, but we will publish um, comments that are perhaps voicing uh, just support for the application. Uh, any additional comments or questions that you want to provide, uh, feel free to send them to me directly by email at uh, gnewman at whiterockcity.ca and I'll do my best to, uh, to help you get the answers you need. So for general reference, the, the property is at the south uh, or the northwest corner of Johnston Road and Thrift Avenue, as I mentioned, is part of the Miramar development buildings three and four. So you can see it in the aerial image there. So this is the project that's subject to the exterior sign program. It's within uh, the, the city's town center as recognized in the official community plan. So recognized as part of the commercial hub of the city's core, um, part of a mixed use commercial residential development in the Miramar project. As I mentioned, this application is for an amendment to a development permit, so it's within the city's town center development permit area guidelines. Um, so there was a permit issued with the with the approval of the Miramar project. Uh, there were signage components that were part of that project, and the applicant is requesting some amendments to uh, that program um, based on on current needs. I'm just uh, admitting a couple other members to the team by phone here. So, um, so there was a permit issued. I wanted just to point the public to one of the things. So one of the responsibilities of the city is to ensure that we're reviewing our development permits against the development permit area guidelines. The DP area guidelines for the town center as it relates to signage uh, includes this sort of specific direction. So it says that uh, there should be efforts to integrate commercial signage with the building and or landscaping. The signage shall have a pedestrian scale and be coordinated throughout each development and compatible with signage on adjacent properties to establish a unified and attractive commercial area. The use of natural materials and projecting signs is encouraged. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Katie Blank, who is with EDG, uh, to provide an overview of the project. Thank you very much for the introduction. I believe we have Barry Marshall actually calling in on the phone. I think he might need to be unmuted. Uh, Greg, do you have that functionality? Yes.
Uh, Katie, you might, um, do you want to share your screen and I'll? Sure can. Uh, Barry, perhaps you want to call back in if for some reason it's not allowing me to unmute you. So for those that might be watching, we're just uh, just waiting a moment for another member of the development applicant uh, development team to uh, to call in. Okay, Greg, Katie, so we should have, have I can hear you, Barry. In the call now. Okay, Greg, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, in the yeah. conference? Thank you. yeah, you're in. Okay, uh, okay, good evening. Um, if I can uh, go ahead with a, an intro. Uh, my name is Barry Marshall, and, and my colleague uh, Katie Blank is, is going to run you through the relevant uh, uh, drawing panels so that you can understand the signage we're proposing. Okay, so um, Greg's done a good job of uh, produce, producing the intro of the project. Um, and if you're a resident tonight, if you're a resident of White Rock, you'll be familiar with the, the development that's been going on for some number of years over, over a number of phases. Uh, we've been asked by Boza to propose signage uh, for uh, phases three and four, the current ones that are under development. And the idea there is to try and, and knit the all four to development and create a, a good community wayfinding for residents and visitors to Miramar Village. And um, we've taken very careful note of the provisions of the development variants of the official community plan, section 22.3, town center development permit area guidelines. And the variants that we're requesting tonight uh, that are proposed mainly deal with trying to create enough visibility from the increasingly dense and busy Johnson Street to one side of the development. Um, this is a familiar pattern that uh, our company has seen throughout Metro Vancouver urban centers as they grow to handle increased demand for mixed use housing and a wide range of retail shops and services. So the variance, variances uh, are listed in detail in our application and um, Katie will run, run through it so that uh, we're able to give you more context and then uh, we'll have some time at the end to uh, respond to any, any questions or clarifications that you require. So with that, I'll turn it over to Katie, if you will. Great, thank you very much, Barry. Uh, again, my name is Katie Blank. I am graphic designer at Edge Experience Design Group. And to give you a little bit more context on this project, we are proposing a signage program for phases four, three and four specifically for Miramar Village. So it best melds with the existing phases one and two, as well as coordinating with the city's official community plan and Town Center Development Permit Area Guidelines. Uh, as you are aware, the site is fronted by Johnston Road and Thrift Avenue, and we are requesting a number of variances to the City of White Rock sign bylaw. Brief description of the site, as you are aware, this is located with Johnston Road along the west and um, Thrift Avenue and Russell Avenue are also fronting the site. Towers one and two have already been completed and there are residential towers rising out of a commercial podium and there are existing retail shops and a community center here. 
new construction for the current towers three and four are directly to the south of a central plaza and those are rapidly uh, completing construction. And this consists of two residential towers atop another retail podium, including a major food store location. And just for your reference, the zoning for this project is Comprehensive Development Zone 16, CD-16. Our overall project intent, we review a number of objectives when we are developing an exterior sign program and consider a number of things in our wayfinding programs. We certainly want to facilitate clear navigation for all modes of transportation to the site, whether you're a motorist, a pedestrian, uh, taking public transport or your cyclist, and we want to signal a strong sense of arrival and reassure first time visitors and as well as those who come occasionally. Uh, we also want to enhance the pedestrian realm and foster an attractive commercial destination. We care very much about presenting a very positive and very attractive visual aesthetic at our projects, and we have a high standard for signage. This also involves presenting a unified and logical family of sign types. Everything is to work cohesively, and signage also needs to integrate well with the architectural design of the development, any existing buildings and retail, as well as site landscaping. We also consider the scale that will best support the minimum visibility and legibility requirements, especially for motorists traveling at higher speeds. So we carefully consider the scale of signage that will best appear for these visitors. And another important consideration, especially considering the residents in the area, we want to mitigate light spillover and excess glare into neighboring residential units. Just to give you context on some of the existing signage at phases uh, one and two, uh, we performed an audit of some of the existing signage. So these are examples of canopy signs and suspended blades. Part of our development for our sign program, we created a cohesive family of sign types and these are examples of some of the signs we consider specifically for tenants. So depending on the size of the tenant and location, they might have an opportunity for a larger sign or they might have something smaller. Uh, we have provisions for fascia signs, canopy signs, and blades. Other sign types we consider include access to the parking and loading, addresses, etc. And also to help aid motorist and pedestrian circulation, there are freestanding signs proposed throughout the site. This is an example sign plan that generally illustrates the locations of every sign type. We won't bore you with the details of every single sign location, but one thing to note is the locations of freestanding signs, for example, that will be one of the variance items we are requesting and we'll go into a little more detail later. Um, so a plan like this will outline specific spots for all of those, uh, etc. Getting into the elevations of the development, this shows you a visual representation of the signage we are proposing and the variances that might be required to reach those uh, conclusions. Some of the examples we show are for anchor tenant signs. Normally these are allowed to be, I believe it's a two foot maximum size uh, in height, and these need to be scaled up considerably for anchor tenants such as the food store opportunity, and we feel this is appropriately scaled for the development. So the anchor tenant sign is one example of a sign type that requires a variance. Another sign requiring a variance are the freestanding map directories, as we have an increased quantity of these on the site. Normally we are allowed a quantity of one, but due to the rather large expanse of the development and the, pla the plaza, we think that 
pedestrians need a little more opportunity to circulate, therefore the higher quantity. Um, along the west elevation, this is just another example of signage locations, nothing to note here for variants. This is the north elevation that would be visible from the central plaza. Again, you can see a number of freestanding sign locations, as well as another sign for the food store requiring variants. Again, along the east elevation. This is from the pedestrian breezeway in between the two phases. You see another anchor tenant sign location, as well as other standard uh, tenant signage. Looking west from the pedestrian breezeway, same thing, looking in the opposite direction. And then the overall east elevation looking along Johnston Road. Again, we have some anchor tenant signs that are uh, regarding variants for a higher height and uh, freestanding tenant directory. This sign needs a variance for increased sign height for motorists. Another thing we wanted to just identify in some of our considerations is we do careful calculations of the letter size and legibility requirements depending on what mode of transportation someone might be taking. A motorist, depending on what speed you're traveling at, can dictate the height of the letters you have to utilize. And if you're looking at something for pedestrian readability, you consider the visibility distance in order to dictate what height you include for the letters. We also look at things like color contrast. How does the text uh, contrast visually with the background in terms of color, its letter form, its lighting. These are all things we carefully consider in our application. These are essentially fabrication details of some of the tenant signage. The anchor tenant signs, again, these are the ones that we're asking for a variance for an increased sign height. And the reason why we are proposing this for this particular sign is because we need to ensure the visibility requirements of first time and occasional visitors. And considering the scale of the site, we're going to need something a little larger. Also for anchor tenant signs, they have a more important opportunity than some of the smaller retailers. In contrast to standard, a regular tenant fascia sign is a little smaller. So this also helps create a little bit of hierarchy in between the tenants. Tenants can also have a canopy sign depending on the architecture in that particular location. And you've probably already seen this chart that's outlining the variances to the sign by law we are specifically seeking. So again, the anchor tenant signage, sign type one, this details the specific heights we're asking a variance for. And again, our rationale is we want to ensure the visibility requirements of first time and occasional visitors and also establishing hierarchy for anchor tenants. Um, this is also appropriately scaled for the architecture and considers setback distances where applicable. Canopy signage, I should also point out that these technically do require a variance to the sign by law because they actually need, we need to mount them below the canopy. And if you interpret the sign by law correctly, these signs are normally mounted to the face of the sign due to the L flip back, due to the narrow face of the canopy, you don't have much surface to mount on. Therefore, we need to actually go below. So that's a variance we would like to pursue to allow for adequate sign sizes and also assist with motorist and first time visitor legibility. Um, this is also consistent with the signage at towers one and two as well. The parking entrance signs also require a variance technically to allow for an increased sign area. This larger area is required to fill out the entire width and again, reinforce the minimum visibility requirements for visitors. 
We've also included a crash bar that will help ensure visitor safety and prevent building and vehicle damage. And this crash bar is also calculated against the sign area. We also have a handful of freestanding signs that we are requesting variance for in terms of quantity. Again, a single freestanding sign is permitted for the development. We are requesting a total of four freestanding signs. This includes the freestanding map directory and freestanding tenant directory. Our rationale for this is that given the size of development and in excess of the property sizes typically addressed in the sign bylaw, we feel that these signs are required at regular intervals to ensure circulation, but also visibility requirements, especially for pedestrians as well. And the freestanding tenant directory, that larger one you see along Johnston Road, that's also required a variance for the height. And again, that size is proposed carefully to ensure the visibility requirements of visitors, but especially motorists traveling at full speed down Johnston Road. Um, these are just some renderings of the signage we are proposing. And again, you can see that these have been scaled appropriately to suit the development and visibility requirements, and we think they're quite tasteful. In terms of the material, they're very minimalist. They correspond well with the architecture, have very minimal impact on pedestrian circulation. We integrate with landscaping wherever possible. This is an example of the signage going along the food store. This is directly visible from the central plaza. And then this is a view looking from the south along Thrift Avenue. This is an example of the anchor tenant sign that is requiring a variance uh, due to the increased height. So that's what I have right now. Barry, did you want to add anything to this? Um, if I'm still connected. Yep, you are. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, thank everybody for the, well, I want to thank everybody in the city planning. Um, it's, it's been a good process and they organized this public information meeting as per the bylaw and the city policy. So it gives you an opportunity to see what is proposed. Um, we're not to toot our own horn, but we're known for you know, creating elegant and usable solutions for signage. So we're hoping you agree with that, but we do look forward to any comments or concerns. And I believe you, you may, there may be some written in concerns for this evening for us to deal with. So we look forward to addressing those. And um, I believe there's some, Greg will confirm, but I believe there's a, a follow-up presentation to the, to the design uh, panel and uh, there'll be other steps to ensure that this meets the requirements of the community. So look, look forward to your feedback. Great, uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, Katie, was there anything else you wanted to add or? Uh, that's basically wrapping up our presentation, but I'm happy to dive into questions. Sure, so what I'll do is I'll just, um, I'll share my screen. Yeah, so thanks for the presentation. We're now into the, um, the Q&A section. And I do see we, we did get one uh, question there and there are about six attendees. So if people are wondering how many people have tuned in, I've got a, a count of about six people. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a Q&A function that you should be able to see on your screen. If you want to start to submit your questions and comments, you're more than welcome to. Um, what we'll do is we'll start to publish those questions and comments as they come in. And then I'll look to uh, Katie or Barry uh, to respond. Um, Barry, for your benefit, because you're calling in, I'll, I'll read out the question. And um, we also have an online comment form. So if you go to the city's events calendar, it's, it's up on the screen there. Um, there's a comment form. You're welcome and, and sort of invited to submit your comments using the form. It's a digital form. It's all online. You hit submit and, and it is sent to city staff and then we'll be providing the applicant with a, comp, uh, a copy. 
um, but we'll provide you with a response as well through that forum and, and, and those questions or comments will be presented to Council within a future report. And as I mentioned, you can also send uh, comments or questions to me directly. So let's open it up. I see we do have uh, one comment so far. I'll publish the comment and then uh, I'll read it here for, for a caller's benefit. Uh, so White Rock is called City by the Sea. What consideration have you given to this theme in designing these signs? Um, okay, Katie, do you mind if I address that? Go ahead. Um, the, the, sh the short answer is we have worked with uh, White Rock before. The White Rock Museum uh, is an example um, of a, a project that we worked on and certainly because it's faced the seawall and the railway track and the historic pier, um, that was a, a, a considerable uh, reference point for, for any design suggestions for the museum. Um, unfortunately, those designs have never been enacted, but it, it was a theme that was specific to that location. Up here on the, the brow or the center of town, um, we've taken, uh, to be honest, we've taken our lead from the architecture and the um, intent of the mixed use environment for both the residents and the shops below. Um, so my city by the sea, um, we certainly understand the, uh, the we understand the identity for for your unique community, um, but uh, that isn't re reflected in any overt way. Uh, we've gone for more of a uh, more the the design intent was to uh, integrate with the urban setting that is evolving in the center of town there, and with the architecture of the four phases and, and uh, with even more emphasis on the phase three and four, the newest phases that are being built out. So uh, no particular reference to my city by the sea, I'm afraid. If I can even add on to that, well, we do appreciate any opportunities to design to a theme such as that. We not only want to reinforce the architecture, but we also normally like to utilize a more timeless aesthetic for our signage because that's something that will age well with the development and will also suit the commercial tenants well. Uh, thanks, Barry and Katie. Uh, Katie, if you want to um, take control of the screen to bring your presentation back sure. as we respond to these, feel free to. Uh, I'll read the next question. It says, why do you need an extra foot of height uh, on the anchor tenant signs when these signs will be brightly lit? Will there not be massive light pollution already from the four buildings? Uh, and, I, and I'll just, um, the light pollution, I have spoken with a couple members of the public about the project and that has been uh, a concern expressed by uh, some residents of the Miramar building about how the, how the individual signage will be lit. Do well, you, one uh, way do you want that addressed? Oh, yes, sorry. please. <laughs> yeah, we um, edge edges uh, all on all projects, and certainly on this one. And uh, are we're aware of um, mixed use projects uh, when they're built with um, the onlooking residents from across the street and from the development itself. And so we take a lot of care with making sure there's no large backlit boxes and in fact most signed bylaws uh, particularly in urban centers now actually uh, you know rule against having large backlit boxes and what i mean by that the old style sign if you remember them there used to be a big a white box or a light colored box with the lettering on top of it there's no no signage uh, used throughout metro vancouver not just white rock but throughout metro vancouver area so uh, what you do is you have a, a, a little edge illumination or, a, or the letter itself is the only illumination. So there isn't a large area of, of illumination. We've also put the provision, you know, if the city wants to see that, we've put a provision for dimming and also for night lighting control, which uh, is becoming more and more typical to the region. And what, the, what we mean by lighting controls is they can be turned off at a certain hour, say 11 p.m., and then come back on at, at say 7 a.m. in the morning or whatever particular requirement of the community. So that can be built, that's built into the uh, 
electrical provisions for the illumination. So it's a discrete illumination. It's uh, just the lettering or the edge of the lettering illuminated in some cases. Some of these signs aren't, aren't illuminated at all. And um, I, we are quite familiar with best practices in, in glare and something called halation. And uh, we're confident that they're not going to disrupt uh, any more than a uh, you know, any more than the, a, a, you know, a, a typical retail sign would be uh, along the street. Um, so the idea is to, particularly if we can put these uh, adjacent to the canopy or even under the edge of the canopy, that'll take uh, any glare that there might be uh, to residents above in their apartments and condominiums. Thanks, Barry. And um, another part to that same uh, comment was why the the need for the extra foot of height on the anchor tenant sign, and I think Katie, in your in your overview, you, you spoke a bit to legibility and motorist legibility, first time uh, passerby legibility. Did you want to speak to that a bit? Yeah. So again, that is to help establish hierarchy between the anchor tenants and standard tenants, but also reinforces legibility requirements due to considerable setback from Johnston Road is a good example. Uh, for example, I'll flip back to the plan. Say you're traveling uh, along Johnston Road and you need to find parking. And so you turn to Thrift Avenue. The size of the signage that you see at quite a distance needs to be large enough that you can see it all the way from that corner. The same goes if you're traveling in the opposite direction or even if you're further up the road and you're seeing this clear across from the plaza. If you have something that is entirely compliant with the bylaw, it might not be visible enough for those motorists. Katie, do you have uh, an image that shows the anchor tenant sign? Because I think another thing that's uh, important maybe just to highlight is that the, um, Barry was mentioning the more traditional or the older maybe now out of date uh, form of signs where you have the sign area, which is the white box and you have the lettering within the box. Mm -hmm. and, and the approach that, that you're presenting here is to have, to not have the white box in behind the sign, but more to have the individual- Individual channel letters. Individual channel yeah. letters. And, and, and you so, can see that in this rendering yeah, and here, I, I for would just example. Yeah, so I would acknowledge our, our sign bylaw um, has not yet caught up, let's say, to the, the current approach, the more modern approach to dealing with signs. So we're regulating in the bylaw the, the sign copy area height, uh, but your anchor tenant sign is also uh, multi sort of, um, it's, it's the letters are over top of each other. Ah, so it's a stacked logo format in this instance. Yeah, so, so that's sort of also contributing to the, the height variance that's being sought. And that's uh, also Katie, to, yep. Um, can you bring up the, do we have a rendering from Johnston that, that shows into the plaza? That was also another factor, that distance from the, from the, plaza, from the yeah. adjacent streets. Are you there, Barry? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was looking for the. Uh, yeah, there's the run. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a there's a view for our audience. They can see from Johnson Street that that food store, even though those letters are are taller than they would be right on the street, there yeah, it's a long distance back to that setback plaza. You can see it on the construction site or in this rendering. Um, it wouldn't, if they were done on a smaller size, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be legible to somebody going by, particularly as a motorist. Hi, Greg, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, is, everybody. Is that John? It's, it's, yes, it is. It's John Martin. Um, run the commercial property management at BOSA. And I just wanted to give a bit of context if I could. Um, just with that food store sign, that anchor sign, 
even with the sign variance, um, the feedback that we're getting from you know prospective tenants, prospective you know, anchor grocers is that the visibility is a, is a is very problematic off Johnston and Thrift, and so these these addition you know this, this additional height and these these variances are crucial to attracting a tenant at this location. We've actually lost our initial tenant uh, because of this very fact. Um, and so if we need to, we really do need to um, increase that visibility off Johnson, major thoroughfare. And there's that line of sight where, where that food store is located there, uh, which is crucial uh, for those vehicle uh, passerbys. So just to give that, that additional context, so that's, that's been a, a major factor in um, that initial uh, grocer following through. Thanks for that, John. What I'll do, actually, there are a couple of comments that we've gotten that relate <clears throat> to the height of the signage. So I'll publish those comments. I'll read them uh, for caller's benefit. So the next comment uh, that I've just published here, it says, I noticed the save on food sign as an example for an anchor tenant. Uh, how high was the lettering on that one? It looks a lot smaller than uh, three foot six, and, and yet it's highly visible. So I think what you just mentioned, John, about having consulted with uh, potential tenants and, and having them express a need for, for taller signage might be part of the rationale, but I, I don't know if anyone wanted to elaborate on that. Um, we've actually, um, Edge has had the benefit of working on um, several projects with, with major food tenants. Um, if, if you're using Save On as an example, um, when they're in a village type setting like this, that typical lettering size, we're, we have a hard time keeping it down to three foot six, plus they'll have an eight foot high circular logo. If anybody's familiar with the Save On Green logo, it's a save in three foot six, and then an eight foot uh, circle with on, and then food, so in the last part, if, if my memory serves me well. But uh, they, they, t they, on, on major shopping centers, they, they uh, not village type uh, mixed use, major shopping centers, they typically have letters of five or six feet high, plus a tw up to a 12 foot circle. So <laughs> this is, this is a, a subdued for that type of retailer. The other thing is we're on, right now we don't know the final food tenant, but they're likely to have a green letter or, a, you know, a, an orange letter or a, you know, a colored letter. So they won't be, some of that visibility will drop off and the rendering we're just showing white because it gives us the best possible legibility at that distance. But uh, in our view, uh, the size is not excessive. And uh, what, what you, if you don't do it properly, what you run the risk of a food re retailer. I know of one case exactly on number five road in Richmond where the food retailer moved in there and because no one could see them, uh, they didn't get any business, and six months later they were gone. And uh, I, we certainly have to support the commercial. We have to balance the commercial use of, of the of this tenancy with, uh, you know, the uh, reality of the urban setting. So uh, the commercial success, unfortunately, uh, is important. Uh, I'll I'll publish in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next one relates to um, it says. To reduce light pollution, at what time is the signage lighting turned off? This should be written into any approval. And this is something you had mentioned, Barry, as being an option. And I think that's something we can certainly evaluate moving moving forward in the review of this proposal. Yeah, it's uh, it's not right now. It's not uh, written in in every community's uh, bylaws, but it's starting to be a. Uh, I can I can mention a half dozen of them in the Metro Vancouver area that are now starting to ask for that as a even if it isn't in the bylaw they're asking as sort of a community uh, benefit if you will. Um, yeah, so so we'll look, we'll look at that as we move forward with this uh, proposal. Um, next comment here. Uh, three brightly lit directory signs is a bit excessive. What type of directory signs are being used now and how many are there? Uh, Greg, it's Carl on the line. I <clears throat> thought there was some additional information that might be helpful for the previous question and the current one. Uh, if you could uh, give me control over the screen here. I think they got it now. 
Yeah. So uh, what you see on your screen now is an exterior sign package for Semiamu Mall. And in that case, um, the tenant fascia signage that was requested and approved is a, a four foot high uh, signage for the major tenants. And that's um, for a very similar reason. So it's not um, uncommon to have signage even in excess of what's being proposed here. Um, and I just offer that as a, a point of comparison, which is very close by and would be likely competitors with the businesses at Miramar Village. Um, and then with the, um, so I'm gonna end sharing this screen and then share another. Um, there's a question about the um, existing um, signage here. Sorry, we'll just give me one more moment. Um, are you able to see the image on my screen now or not yet? Uh, right now we see elevations. Okay, um, so I think I'm going to close my share tray. Apologize for the technical uh, difficulties here. Now it's giving me the right option. Um, there is a question about the, what's currently on site. So the um, the two buildings that are currently constructed, which include the community center, do not have a tenant directory. Um, the community center being in the, the one building and then a number of retail tenants in the other. Um, as you have now four towers being completed and in numerous businesses that will be part of that, um, people will arrive at the site without having an awareness of necessarily which tower um, or street frontage is um, the location for the business that they're intending to visit. So we do think it's important um, that we enhance the wayfinding so that you don't come to uh, the community center looking for the Three Dogs Brewing, which is across the plaza. We, we increase that. And what I'm showing here is um, prior to the construction of the last two towers, um, the wayfinding signage of the monument sign that was on site at the time was about 25 feet high by nine, and a, nine foot and nine inches wide, uh, which far exceeds what the, the current monument signs are being proposed as. This is again, more of an auto oriented uh, sign, um, which is really directed solely towards motorists. And what we're uh, seeing with the proposal is something that's more meant to be balanced between um, pedestrians and motorists. So it's visible for motorists, but it's really quite a bit smaller than this obviously more suburban type context. Um, so I'll let um, EDG uh, take over if they wanted to comment on uh, the, the um, question currently. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl. This is Barry again from EDGE. Um, this would give the viewer, um, anybody in, still in our audience, uh, an idea of what I was talking about, about the dated signage that is now um, starting to be dis disappear in, in sign bylaws. Now, a lot of the sign bylaws uh, are go out of date. You know, they can be two, three decades old, but but this is a good example of the, in my view, horrible <laughs> signage that used to happen with the large white backlit panels. And it would consider, all, besides the size of the sign, the light glare from that type of signage was, was as uh, Carl points out, was, was strictly to alert uh, drive-by audience with no consideration of what impact it would have on uh, on the community at large, the public realm. Uh, never mind, it was completely overscaled for any pedestrian use. These freestanding directories are intended almost solely for for just pedestrian use for the community. Uh, they're they're smaller in scale and um, and something that uh, is asked for by all all the uh, communities and, and and metropolitan areas that we work in um, across Canada. So, uh, increasingly, people want to have better better wayfinding because uh, a mixed use community is more confusing than obviously a single a single use with the shops in a separate shopping center. Thanks, Barry. And I, I've also published an additional question that relates to the same uh, concept of the freestanding signs and whether they're oriented towards motorists or pedestrians. And I think you can see from the previous signage that was on um, the the site, the, the Bilo Foods and the other signage, uh, that it wasn't uh, pedestrian oriented in the way that is being proposed now. Um, 
certainly there may be differences of opinion or concerns um, that the person was sharing that it's larger than they would like. But I, I think considering what was here previously, it's much more pedestrian oriented um, in my opinion. I think further to that, um, I think we're looking at Greg's screen right now. If we actually look at the sign types, uh, two pages from here that outline uh, the freestanding signs. If you take a look at sign type 10, which is specifically the one we are asking for an increased quantity of, these ones are absolutely not scaled for motorist visibility at all. The text is much too small for a passing motorist and the positioning of the map and the directional information is directly within the line of sight of a pedestrian. So that is something we carefully consider in evaluating the overall sizes. Um, again, we, we want to discourage, you know, excess signage that is in poor taste and we do want to carefully balance between pedestrians and motorists, but um, I, I, I would disagree with that assessment that all of these freestanding signs are for motorists only. Sorry, uh, I, I published another uh, question here, comment um, regarding why not proceeding with the ex existing approved signage. So the, there was signage that was approved uh, with the separate development permit number 288, and that was back um, maybe 2007 or eight, I think when that was initially done uh, possibly later, but in any case, almost over 10 years ago. So there's a number of things that have changed, not only the technology, um, but the comment was that is that met the existing sign bylaw and that that actually isn't true. The current signage for the community center, because it's under canopy signage that isn't uh, perpendicular to the building, it it runs parallel to the building. Uh, that actually did require a variance to the city signage bylaw. And that's one of the purposes of having a comprehensive sign plan is so that where there are variances, they can be considered as a holistic approach. Um, it was considered appropriate that the city um, signage for the community center be oriented parallel to the building as it allowed for better visibility for people passing through the, the middle of the block. Um, so that was one of the um, previous variances that were approved under the earlier development variance per or development permit. Um, and then as um, EDG has outlined, there's additional um, changes that have been made since then. They do require variances, but our, our bylaws can't be comprehensive enough to consider all possibilities. And the sign bylaw itself explicitly um, directs that uh, variances would be considered through a comprehensive sign plan. Um, I did have that bylaw open uh, if anyone is wanting for the reference of that. Um, yeah, it's section part three, section five of the, the sign bylaw. Provisions of the bylaw may be varied in conjunction with the approval by council of a comprehensive sign plan and development permit, which is exactly uh, what's being applied for now. Thanks, uh, Carl. I think you may have published some more things. I'll I'll turn it back over to you on the, the question publishing. No, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I did publish a comment. I don't I don't believe it. It's requesting a response. Um, the next uh, comment I'll publish here, it says it, it refers to canopies. So canopies were never mentioned originally. These will add clutter to the whole development and actually block visibility. Why introduce them when you're asking for increased heights and signage and more brightly lit directories? Um, Katie, if you want to take control of the screen, feel free to, to reshare your PDF. And sure. With you. Okay, so I'm trying to actually understand the question. I wonder if you want to speak maybe to the canopy design because it, it's not your traditional um, sort of fabric canopy that maybe one um, associates with that yeah. of signage. I, I may chime in a little here, sure. Katie. Sorry for uh, taking over. Go ahead. Um, so one of the design uh, requirements um, in our development permit area guidelines is weather protection for pedestrians. So commonly adjacent to buildings, these canopies are provided so that whether it's uh, pouring rain or beautiful days like we usually get in White Rock, 
um, places are easy to visit without being exposed to the weather. So the canopies really do relate more to, to that aspect rather than providing a location where signage can be placed. Um, they are part of the current um, phase one and two or the buildings A and B in um, Miramar Village. And so the, the sign, the canopies that are being proposed in the next buildings, uh, they've actually already been installed on the buildings if you, if you go past them and they are consistent with what was previously constructed. So I, I don't know if there's anything that uh, needs to be added uh, by Katie on that. Um, if there's some sign aspects that you want to, to mention. Um, I could mention that the signage mounting distance from the building facade is considerably closer to the building than you might sometimes see in other developments. Um, but we chose to go this direction as that was consistent with towers one and two. Yeah, I uh, think what, um, what, what you might miss when you look at the architectural drawings is you're thinking the signs are mounted or hanging right out over the street or, you know, at the far side of the sidewalk. These are sort of tucked under to, again, thinking of a village type development. So they're more, um, you know, more intimate to the shop face itself, the shop front. And as Katie says, they, they were a, a style of signage that was uh, not only that we're familiar with and is, is considered best practices throughout Metro Vancouver, it was also used in the precedent towers one and two. So it, it seemed like uh, the best choice. And, um, and the reason they're not mounted on the front of the canopy, uh, which, which calls, what it calls for strictly in the, uh, the bylaw, the bylaw is considering a, um, a couple of out-of-date features. One is that these mixed-use uh, or and shopping centers used to have a large canopy with a down with an upstand or downstand, which we, we want to describe it, and they would typically put the name on that front edge or the canopy itself as a thick edge with the sign mounted on the front. In our view, while we don't have that type of canopy, it's a slimmer, lighter, uh, translucent canopy, uh, which I believe it's. Uh, I can't remember on this one if it's glazed on the top, but I mean, it's yes. lighter in construction. And uh, and it was a precedent type with 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 the, as I say, with the first phases of Miramar Village. So it seemed appropriate to continue with that style. Okay. Thanks, Barry. Uh, the, the Barry, next... just to confirm. Oh, sorry, Greg, just no, John, to confirm. They are, they are glazed, glazed canopies, so they allow no light transference and uh, very little clutter, um, very minimal aesthetic. So, um, to that question, um, it won't it won't clutter the the facade and any of the pedestrian walkways um, on the inward portion of that retail component. And um, so, the next uh, question is: Will the city create a bylaw to have the sign shut off at 11 p.m. or will the developer agree to include that provision in his variance application? Um, I've mentioned we can we can look into that as we sort of debrief on all the comments that we received tonight and, and comments or questions we receive in writing. I don't know if anyone wishes to speak to that. Uh, Carl, I think you're on mute. Thanks, Greg. Um, since the question is directed more towards the city, I, I think the um, options for creating rules around timing of uh, sign shut off. One would include a, a condition in a development permit that's specific to this property so that it's not necessarily um, across the city as a bylaw. Um, but if that is a concern for this particular development because it's mixed use or for whatever reason, um, it is something that we can look at incorporating into the terms and conditions of a development permit. Thanks, Carl. Um, just a follow up question on the canopy. Um, a participant is expressing confusion as the consultant mentioned they would need more canopies and those uh, shown were different than the one Mr. Isaac mentioned. Uh, can we get clarification on uh, what the consultant is asking for in the variance? How many are needed? And I believe this may uh, be clarification of the number of directory signs, which is tied to the variance. Uh, we're not asking um, 
there's not a request in this application for relief from the, the number of canopy signs. Yeah, and, and typically so like, oh, thanks, sorry about that. Okay. On the number of directory signs, um, we have very few uh, large scale developments that are almost the size of a, a city block. Uh, in White Rock, so we haven't had a need for multiple directory signs, which would be uh, clutter. But in this case, it's, the site has three uh, frontages, Russell Avenue, Johnson Road, Thrift Avenue. There are many ways to access the site, and so having additional wayfinding signage as monument signs, uh, there's a strong rationale that here, where you've got a larger site, it would be uh, beneficial to, to help people get around and find themselves on the site. Uh, I've, I've sorry, published to jump. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, John. I just, I just wanted to add that um, I have quite a bit of experience in kind of mixed use master plan environments. And and to your your point there, Carl, um, there's often a lot of confusion with pedestrians and and accessing the parkade and stairwells and elevators, getting back to those vehicles uh, because the varying parking levels. And just access points, and so those those podium signs are, are crucial. Podium signs, pardon me. Uh, and oftentimes we're going back to the city with a retrofit install because we, you know, we find that if pedestrians and vehicles are, are you know are confused, that their orientation is lost on the site. Um, you, you know, it's hard to to picture that um, because you know maybe the, the the photos don't give you that impression. But when you're actually physically on site. And that those directories are absolutely crucial in, in directing people the right way. Um, so just, I just want to add that context. I think just drawing on that uh, as we're on the topic of the marquee or the directory signs, there was a comment about wayfinder signs should be uh, inside um, the buildings uh, like malls and not outside as proposed. I don't, I don't know if you want to speak to the configuration of the retail. Um, units within the development? Um, well, I, any, any one of us can jump in as is Barry again at EDGE. Um, this is clearly a, um, the retail in, in um, I think in most cases here, if not all cases, is externally uh, oriented. It's, it's meant to be seen from either a public plaza, publicly accessible plaza, or the public street. And so it's a different condition uh, which is common to these mixed-use developments. It's 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 a different uh, development type than a shopping center, which is in you know in the internal mall. I mean, even that style of of mall or shopping is disappearing in Metro Vancouver. Um, if you if you witness uh, some of the larger developments happening, and we've certainly worked on all of them, like Metropolis and Metrotown. It's a completely different condition. But even there, Metropolis and Metrotown where it has large internal malls, there's uh, the need that John Martin just pointed out for pedestrian wayfinding, uh, just to find uh, find your way back to the surface parking around the mall, which would be closer to the condition here, and uh, and to find parking, access to parking levels and exit and egress. So, uh, but anyway, this is, this, is an, this, this retail is externally oriented to other public plaza or public streets. So it's a different condition. It doesn't have interior, uh, it doesn't have an interior mall configuration. Uh, there was a question about will there be free parking on site so that customers can get out of their cars and walk around to discover the diversity of stores on site. There is a proposed mix of obviously parking for the residents and, and um, parking for visitors. Did anyone want to speak to the commercial supply of parking and how it will be uh, managed? Yeah, so our intention right now is to prepare for potentially future pay parking, but at this time we have no plans to actually institute it. I think what we will do is have a, a parking manager. Uh, we're talking to a few. Um, the strata there, the existing strata has used uh, in park. Uh, we have other contacts, you know, West Park and you know, Advanced Parking, it's now Reef. And, and we're talking to all of them about just sort of monitoring a, a parking limit just to ensure that nobody's sort of, um, you know, any visitors aren't parking and leaving their car there for an extended period of time, not actually utilizing the center. So really it's just about 
you know, um, allowing us you know, enough parking to serve those commercial tenants and to serve the visitors you know, to the residents and the towers. There's there's uh, sufficient parking uh, for for all the tenants, including the entry group. Thanks. Yeah, nice. I've uh, published a, a comment or question, uh, someone th suggesting the um, worry shouldn't be about car traffic and that the idea of the town centre is to create a pedestrian friendly community. Um, yes, we are looking at a walkable pedestrian friendly uh, area. However, most stores can't survive only on the uh, foot traffic of people who live in the immediate area. So people do have to travel to, uh, to the site for, from West White Rock, from East White Rock. Uh, from beyond and so they in order to uh, locate the business that they're looking to to get to sometimes the signs need to be visible to those motorists as well um, there's a question or a comment the speed limit on Johnson Road is 30 kilometers per hour uh, it's not actually it's it is 50 kilometers per hour um, with the exception of the school zone area further south on the 1200 block of Johnston um, so in this area it, it is 50 kilometers per hour there's no other posted speed limit so the default is um, 30. Uh, there's an, another one I'm going to publish here, which uh, is why are city staff justifying the proposals? Were they involved in developing them? So with every application that the city receives, we like to do pre-application meetings with applicants and advise them of these are what our policies are, how their proposal may be um, supportable through those policies or guidelines or not. Um, so yes, we are in discussions with uh, with applicants and certainly the orientation of the signs to be focused for pedestrians is something that uh, we communicated and, and supported the, the design work as they progress through their uh, changes and revisions to the application. Um, ultimately, it's not our proposal, but we are involved in providing comments to uh, the applicants based on what the city's policies and design guidelines are. Great, thank, thanks for that, Carl. So uh, the next comment is, how are these signs designed to make them safe from the high winds that are already identified in this wind tunnel? Um, okay, uh, Barry at Edge, I can comment on that. Um, these, uh, everything we design for signage um, in, in uh, Metro Vancouver, which would include White Rock is designed to a 50 year uh, wind load. Um, the most exceptional circumstance we've that I recall in the last few years was in 20, 2009. We had to design a very large freestanding uh, welcome center outside of Canada Place, and they, uh, because of the uh, adjacency of towers and uh, and Canada Place and the new convention center itself, they they, they deemed that that was going to be the highest possible wind you'd ever get right off the harbor. And uh, that had to be specifically engineered for tie downs uh, for that 50 year provision. The, we have that, that structure I'm talking about was 40 feet tall. These, these are very much smaller, but they still be designed for a 50 year uh, wind load. And, and um, you know, they're designed so that, you know, there's no uh, sharp edges that would affect uh, pedestrians. There's no uh, likelihood of panels or pieces being dislodged in, a, in an inadvertent uh, wind gust. Um, as far as I know, uh, the 50 year provision covers White Rock. If someone knows something different, this is a good time to, to flag that, but uh, that's a, a wind, it's a wind condition that uh, uh, you're not likely to see uh, once, once in 50 years. Uh, there's a, a comment here. Will paid parking be a detriment to people shopping at these establishments? I don't know if, if anyone wishes John to respond. Here. Yeah, John here with both. So I'm, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, it could very well be. Uh, and that's definitely under consideration. Uh, we're, we're, we're looking at the facilities, the, the different projects in the area and what sort of the existing uh, precedents uh, set in the White Rock community and uh, we've, we've definitely run an analysis and, and concluded that at least initially uh, we're not going to pursue pay, pay parking just for that very fact that we want our commercial tenants to be successful. We, we don't want to deter 
uh, anyone from coming to the center and shopping at it. Uh, we want it to be a, a vibrant uh, center for the community. And of course, uh, if paid parking is a deterrent, um, you know, that's definitely a factor and, and under consideration. Um, the existing service parking that's managed by the uh, one of the, the strata towers there, um, just directly adjacent to tower C and D, is currently paid parking. So there is uh, paid parking directly on the same master plan site. Um, but at this time, we don't have any plans to um, institute pay parking for the commercial uh, parking on Piwa. Great, thank you, John. So we have uh, about 20 minutes left. We'll allow the, the comps and questions to continue to come in. I see we have another one here, so I'll publish that. Uh, can you clarify if the signs and canopies will be using wood or natural materials as specified in the preamble in the pictures? Uh, what is proposed doesn't seem to be made up of natural materials. Um, you, you're, that's a correct assumption by that uh, respondent. Uh, this, it's not that uh, we have used in park, uh, for instance, we do, did sign standards for uh, BC parks in, in, in parks or rural locations. We have used heavy uh, timber wood. We find that um, wood used in uh, thinner sections and veneers and that sort of thing. The, 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 uh, if anybody's owned a wooden boat in the Metro Vancouver area, you know it doesn't last very long. So it ends up being where we've had where we've wanted that kind of aesthetic. If the architecture uh, demanded it or the you know, the community development demanded that uh, there are artificial materials. Uh, there's a painted surface that is a faux wood. Uh, that was not a choice that was uh, pursued on this. Um, it, most of the construction is um, steel, galvanized steel core with a, with a, a treated aluminum uh, exterior, you know, either painted or some other kind of finish. Um, and then uh, some heavy uh, UV stabilized vinyl applications. These are based on trying to give a, a, a 30 year life to the products. With wood, you're looking with a use, use of real, uh, you know, local woods, you're, you'd be looking at having to re-varnish these or retreat them, you know, on a constant basis. So it would be it would be a maintenance consideration that uh, most people would not want to take on. Okay, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I, I'll share my screen, Katie. I'll just provide a brief okay. overview of, of next steps. And if, if additional questions and com comments come in, um, we can respond to them as they do. Um, we will see the meeting right to seven o'clock. So if people are uh, frantically typing their comments or, or wish uh, for some additional time, you'll certainly have until, until seven. Uh, I'm just reading a comment that's just come in here. So it, it relates to wind, uh, the close placement of these buildings and the winds coming up the southern slope from the beach make for much higher wind speeds than 50 year basis because of the vortex effect. Uh, do you want to uh, spare again from edge to do you want me to address that one? Uh, sure, if, if you wish. Um, yeah, yeah I've, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit confused about the concern about wind. We're certainly aware that winds on seaside or oceanside locations and uh, you know we work extensively on Vancouver Island and Victoria etc. I think Victoria is uh, probably known as a windier, I grew up there, known as a windier city than, the, than White Rock even. Um, they they uh, regularly have, uh, they have ha experienced 100 mile winds enough to flip a float plane. I can assure you that these things will be uh, designed with best practices. They're, they're, they're much smaller um, so their effect from wind will will not be the same as a building, but they'll be designed with um, large threaded tie downs into solid concrete bases. They'll have a structural steel core, and uh, they'll be designed in, as I say, robust 
non-rusting, non-corrosive uh, exterior skins. So we've never, certainly in the 40 years we've we've been doing it, we've never experienced any damage. Um, there is um, the only wind-related sign that I'm, I'm not saying that there hasn't been signs somewhere in the world that have come down from wind. The only wind-related one that I personally know of was in the township, I don't know if you call it the city or township of Steveston, a, a, a township within uh, Richmond, BC. Uh, on that coast, they had an extraordinary wind event that did dislodge a few, um, I don't know how to describe them, they were sort of metal banners, uh, so they were just free hanging on clips. And a couple of those apparently the clips came off and and they were dislodged. But that was a different, not a bolt down, bolted into a foundation or bolted onto a, a steel canopy as 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 is proposed in this uh, in this sign plan. Uh, another question here. Thanks for that, Barry. Um, can the directories be made from more natural materials? Red cedar is extremely long lasting. Uh, can brick be used instead of plexiglass? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, um, it, it wasn't considered. Um, I, 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 I think at this, I think at this late event, uh, thinking of. I mean, a, a, a material that looks like red cedar could possibly be used as a background in the in the displays of the directory. I mean, it could be considered. I, I really, I've never, I'm not aware of a satisfactory use of red cedar, except as, as in heavy cedar tim, timber in, in, say, a Whistler style development or in a, um, you know, a resort style development where they, they've they uh, used that in the architecture, um, but using it, using it in signage, uh, going to have a lot of maintenance problems that I don't think we want to take on. I think compounding that also is how does it best relate to the architecture? And I would also be concerned about legibility of any text appearing on such a background. Uh, would, especially once it starts to deteriorate, you're going to lose some of that legibility. Uh, I'll just sort of elaborate on the question. I'm curious, could, can red cedar or a similar natural material be used as the, uh, as the surround of the directory or as maybe a a treatment in the architectural design. It may not be the backdrop to the text sitting in behind the text, but maybe I think yeah, there's been a uh, bit of a. Sorry, we've had um, there used there was um, there is is in certain developments a call for that type of thing. There, we've seen tenants selling um, that are that are vendors of natural products. You know, like like uh, scented products. Uh, uh, yoga studios, that kind of thing, where they've used a carved heavy uh, wood material, not, not cedar or other materials. And they've, uh, you know, they've, um, I guess the, the aesthetic of that went, went, went with them providing a uh, more natural or, you know, close to Mother Earth type of type of uh, service. Um, but uh, but Katie's pointed out, right, the, 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 you know, uh, with a dark cedar, by the time it's varnished, you'd have to be very careful to keep that maintained so that it re remained legible. And it w wouldn't be practical in a, and I, I can't even think of an application offhand, it wouldn't be practical in one of these large tenant signs. It could, could happen on one of the small um, tenant blade signs as an option if, if, a, if a retailer really wanted to do that. I think there's a business called Sage, S-A-G-E, something like that. I think they've occasionally used small wooden signs hanging from their canopy on Fourth Avenue as an example. And, uh, but they're not, you know, they, they, they suffer from legibility, but it's been part of the aesthetic of the shop. The shop is all built out of wooden materials, so it seems to go with it. But uh, 
I don't think we'd, we I don't we'd see, I don't think we'd see a widespread call for that in, in this development. Uh, okay, thanks guys. Uh, there was an add-on question to that or a, sort of a secondary question about the use of brick. Was there any thought on the use of brick as well in, in the, uh, I think in the directory signs? Um, well, they, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm as big a fan of brick as the next person. I, I if if it if there was a real demand for that to match the architectural, I'm not aware that 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 that's the condition here. But um, I'll tell you one thing: by the time you build a brick structure that's got to withstand 50-year winds and and then stand up. Uh, it'll be, require a substantial foundation uh, if you've ever worked with brick, and mm -hmm. it will require a lot bigger sign because of the same size message inside of a brick enclosure. It's going to be, I would imagine, it would add about 30% to the to the area of the sign. Uh, just as a quick calculation, I, I, again, I don't see a requirement for that, but it, you know, it's an interesting comment. I, I have not, nothing personally against brick. Okay, no, that's good to know how, how it relates to kind of the foundation as well. Um, so just in terms of next steps and if additional comments and questions come in, like I say, we'll publish those and, and we can respond to them. Uh, so staff will be taking the feedback from tonight. And as I mentioned, I would encourage people that are participating to do the online, um, do the online form. So there's a link, as I mentioned earlier, uh, on the city's events calendar to a digital comment sheet. So please uh, fill that out if you can, and, and we'll share those with the applicant. And we'll work with the applicant as we uh, move forward with this proposal. It is an amendment to a development permit, so it will be presented to the advisory design panel uh, potentially next month or in October. Uh, we'll then be working on a draft uh, uh, permit and present that to the land use and planning committee. If it's supported by the committee and council, we would have a public meeting because of the variances that are being requested to the sign bylaw. And so the public meeting is a more formal opportunity for members of the public to speak directly to council or through a video uh, medium, medium in the light of uh, COVID. Um, and then if council support of, of um, the work, we would uh, finalize the permit and then present uh, that final permit to council for a decision. Um, I see a couple more questions have come in. So, um, the first question here, maybe Katie, if you want to take control again, it's asking if you can point out the uh, the sign locations uh, slide. Absolutely. And then maybe just to plant seed for the next uh, question, it's asking why is there not a nautical theme to the sign? And since the four towers have a big hint of uh, being a uh, sea cruise liner. Plus, we are so close to the sea, and the whole idea is themed around our city by the sea. Again, this is in a similar vein to an earlier question, but our entire visual aesthetic, we want to be pretty minimalist and timeless. We want it to age very nicely and also complement the architecture. Um, the risk is if we do any sort of very obvious thematic elements does easily get dated over time and we want to avoid that in any signage project we do. I might add to that yeah, the development permit guidelines talk about compatibility with adjacent development. Um, so the most obvious um, uh, complementary development would be the other towers in Miramar 1 and 2, uh, Towers 1 and 2, and so those are already set as context. Um, the Saltaire building on the other side of Johnston Road or others in the area also don't have a nautical theme or marine theme. I, I think we do see nautical themes more along Marine Drive. Uh, a lot of the businesses are oriented towards uh, fish and ships or things like that, and that's probably more um, where we see it as uh, being appropriate um, and that's done more on a voluntary type basis, but it is something that would be on Marine Drive quite consistent and compatible with the adjacent development. Uh, the town centre less so, there hasn't really been that emphasis with any of the existing businesses um, to date. There's uh, one fish and chips place now on Johnson and Roper, but um, aside from that, I'm not aware of any uh, nautical type themes 
in signage in the uh, town center area. Thanks, Carl. There was, a, I, I think, a question that we've um, already spoken to about wayfinder signs should be like inside malls, not marquee signs like proposed. And I, I think Barry had provided a, a rationale in, in the configuration of the retail shops being outward facing and not configured as a, a more traditional mall where you have shared corridor space on the interior of a, of a building. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to elaborate on on that. You can see an example of that in this particular slide of the sign plan. Um, all of these areas that you see are completely open. There are no common corridors that are shared by these areas, and so we wouldn't have an opportunity similar to uh, a traditional mall as you would have. Yeah, and each each pink sign in that slide slide as well, Katie represents, I think, to an extent where you would have access yeah. to a, a retail store. There's, I think it's a, there's a comment around front on building three was meant by the architect to give it a nautical theme. I think it's more uh, a comment. I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. Uh, I don't think we have anybody from NSDA here. I don't, John from Boza might have um, some background on the round front there. I think the more obvious nautical reference is the portholes on the northern sides of the buildings, but. Um, the round front, maybe there is something uh, somewhat nautical to it, but I, I don't think that uh, it necessarily um, relates to the signage aspects or that uh, it, it's a exclusively nautical architectural theme. But uh, maybe if the, the poster has some additional background on that, be be happy to hear. Well, I mean, just just to fill the silence, uh, Barry from Edge, um, we've been involved in this a few years now um, uh, when we weren't involved in Towers 1 and 2, but this is the first time I'm aware, certainly, and our office is aware that there was a nautical intention in the architecture, but uh, I, uh, and, it, and it's certainly not in the uh, town centre guidelines that I've that, that, that we have uh, seen to date unless we miss something so this this is this uh, reoccurring question here is something completely new to us so it, it just wasn't considered because it wasn't a factor and that together with we were picking up on what had been uh, built and approved for towers one and two again there was no nautical theme even though I'm well you know we're, we're familiar with white rock and, and, I, and I agree with it, the earlier comments if you get down by the waterside that might be an appropriate that might be a more appropriate place for a nautical theme I think up here in the urban center there's nothing in the architecture that we're aware in the neighborhood that would suggest that a nautical or marine theme would be appropriate for signage and since we're filling the silence, I think the other contextual piece for that was the Saltaire building was approved around the same time, maybe even came in slightly prior to Miramar Village's application. And if you're familiar with the Bean Around the World um, location and the, the residents above that, that does also have a rounded uh, front. So it's almost um, a, a parallel or matching paired design for either side of Johnston Road. Um, there may be some in nautical intentions way back when, but that was again uh, uh, over 15 years ago, I think. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a subtle re reference. I think we'd have to agree. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. subtle. This John with Bosa here. Yeah, I think you can definitely um, 
you know, make a case for the the portholes to be a, a nautical theme architectural elements that you know this the signage package is really does pertain to the kind of ground plane and activating the commercial area which very much consists of you know, brick and and paneling and, and glazing um, and doesn't really have kind of any architectural elements that would indicate that it's nautical themed in any way and i think the the plan in its current iteration definitely highlights the existing architectural features um, and it's very, you know, uniform with that and complements it very nice. Obviously, uh, you know, probably bias, but um, but yeah, the minimalist approach here is definitely caters to commercial tenants and the varying branding that comes with them. Um, it's very important to keep kind of a muted aesthetic with, with signage so that you can bring in uh, different, different brands um, in, in a very uh, tasteful way. And on that uh, topic, I've just published a question about consistency of lighting and color with the sign packages. Um, and do note that we have uh, Right Rock residents are likely familiar with Three Dogs Brewing and their black and white signage in their existing building on uh, Johnson and Russell um, on the northwest corner of that intersection. Um, there's also Starbucks has been announced as a tenant in Miramar Village and uh, Westminster Savings. Those all have kind of distinct brand images um, for themselves, so they likely would have their own design expression. But maybe um, Katie or uh, Barry be able to speak to the, the commonality of elements in terms of. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so in terms of the fabrication um, of those signs, I guess the um, I go to signage details. Um, generally, we want to see a fairly consistent manufacturing approach to these signs. So usually you would see channel letters or individual letters of some kind rather than the sign boxes, which we absolutely don't want to see. Uh, we also want to reinforce consistent lighting types. So if these are going to be illuminated, they need to be illuminated from within, not from any external light fixtures. And we also want to employ consistency in the color temperature of the light itself. Uh, we usually reference 4100 Kelvins uh, in lighting, which is a very neutral tone, and that way we avoid the unsightly bluish hue you can get from the LED fixtures employed in signage such as this. Um, as for the colors that are employed on the signage, that is up to the individual tenant, as uh, Carl has clarified for us. And um, so these could easily be a, a green for Starbucks, for example. Yeah, the, 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 tenant, the tenant will need to, to they, they need to connect to their customer base. They need to bring their own identity. So the, sh the typefaces, the use of uh, fonts, the spacing of the letters, the use of a logo. Um, we'll use Starbucks as a convenient whipping boy. They'll have their rondelle, the, the, the siren as it's known, uh, which comes from their logo. They'll, they'll have their letter, their letter face. Someone else will have a a scripty type letter. Some someone else will have a block, you know, a blockier type of letter. I mean, there will be a variety as you get with all all uh, retail, and that's part of the the charm and the um, you know draw of 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 their particular retail offering. So we're not controlling that, but 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 as Katie's outlined, we 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 want them to be mounted at a consistent height. We want them to be integrated with the architecture. Uh, we want all the electrical to be concealed and controlled, and um, and we want want it built so that it's you know uh, reasonably easy to maintain, keep clean, you know over over a number of years. So it, you know it's a high quality development and represents all those tenants collectively, but with their own individual uh, expression of color and font, as you would see in any retail mix. And I've also flipped to our signage audit photos of towers one and two. So this is an example of where you can see different tenants employing different colors, but generally they're all employing the same uh, fabrication methods, uh, mounting specifications and illumination. 
Uh, just to follow up on the illumination comment and just being cognizant of time, I think we'll take a few more uh, yeah. questions and comments. And then, uh, as I mentioned, if people have other comments or questions, please do complete the comment sheets or send me an email with those comments and I'll make sure that the, the proponent gets them. Uh, there was a question about flashing or, or um, strobe type lights. Did you want to speak oh, to that? Yes, I agree. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, we want all of our tenant signage to be high quality and we absolutely agree that flashing signage and strobes are prohibited. And I think that's also regulated in the sign by law, if I recall correctly. That's right. Flashing signs are prohibited. Right. Hi, can I ask uh, John with both? So I just wanted to also uh, reassure the audience that you know we take signage uh, as our in, in our commercial division very seriously. Uh, we uh, we we vet every single design and shop drawing. Uh, we use a consultant often to to help us in analyzing what materials, ensuring that they're uh, they're complying with the existing comprehensive sign package. Uh, we don't just let uh, different sign vendors fabricate signs and install them. You know, um, we are very careful uh, in and what designs are actually um, submitted to the city for approval and ultimately approved by the landlord. Um, we take that very seriously and understand that it's, it's um, a major factor in you know, the general aesthetic of, of the ground plane for the retail. Thanks for that, John. So I've just published, uh, I think, what will be our last comment for tonight. Uh, is there going to be a, any historic components to any of the signage around the Central Plaza area? Uh, any reference to surrounding signage uh, to semi ammo First Nation history as well as White Rock history? Um, okay, uh, Barry at Edge again. Um, uh, this this has, beca has become um, uh, a more important consideration and a lot of the developments we're working with these days uh, will certainly look to local First Nations for some input. It hasn't been considered in this commercial sign plan. Uh, it could be a future element, uh, some interpretive or naming element, and that's something we can talk to the developer about, but it's it's not uh, usually uh, part of a, uh, a comprehensive sign plan. It's more of a interpretive or public art discussion that would be a, another subject. But uh, I thank you for your question. Okay, uh, with that, I'm going to just share again uh, the slides so if people wish to provide additional comment or questions. Uh, you should be able to see uh, my contact info on the screen there and a, a link on the city's events calendar to the comment sheet. So uh, with that, I uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating and thanks to our applicants and speakers. And like I say, if there's any additional comments, please feel free to send me an email or a complete a comment sheet. Thanks very much for your time tonight. Okay, take care, Greg. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.